Morning. 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 And if you are here for the first time, just raise your hand. I just want to see you really quick if this is your first time. Look all around. That is great. We are so glad you are here to partake of Friend Day with us. We have a lot of activities after our service. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Pastor John Green. I'm lead pastor here at Cornerstone Church. I could not be more proud of my God and more proud of our church right here at Cornerstone. This has been such a fun week, and I uh, just want to say thank you to parents because uh, you trusting us with your kids, letting us have all this fun all week long has meant the world to us. Coming out here, supporting our program, watching your kids, it means the world to them. And I just want to say a big thank you, and uh, let's, let's give Carrie Thompson and her crew a big thank you. We did have a blast, and I want to thank all the volunteers. I can't tell you how many people it takes to, to put all this together. Uh, we have the Shippenville fire crew here with us this morning. We thank them for the trucks that they brought out, and so many volunteers doing different things with the kids today. And I don't have time to go down through all the lists, but I can tell you that it takes a lot of manpower to make this happen, and I just appreciate the, the working church that we have and all those who have been involved with this program uh, to make this happen. Uh, I just want to share a little bit with you this morning, just, just from my heart, uh, as we're teaching your kids and, and sharing with your children uh, the love of Christ and, and what God's plan is for our lives, uh, I want to invite you to mom and dad and aunts and uncles and grandparents uh, to invest in, in this part of your child's spiritual development and what does that look like in, in your life and, and and we want to invite you even to come alongside of us here at cornerstone and be a part of what we're doing god is doing exciting things here uh, you realize this church is three years old we we just got started and, and look at the great things that god is doing here we're just blown away there's no person uh, that we can point to and say because of this individual uh, this is what has happened. It, because of God and His work, this is what's happening, and we're just blessed to be a part of that. So we're so thankful uh, that you're here. Let me just open with a word of prayer, and I just want to share with you for a few moments uh, the Word of God. Father, right now, as we just take some time uh, to thank you for all these kids that we had throughout the week and the, the, the victories that we have seen, children making decisions for Jesus Christ and we just celebrate here this morning, Father, with moms and dads and grandparents and friends. Uh, we're just so grateful uh, to be a part of this morning. We thank you for the sunshine, uh, the abundance of sunshine, and uh, just holding off on the rain. And God, this is just a gorgeous day. We give you the praise. And, and right during this time, Father, as we just listen for a moment from your word, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, Father. We're, we're here to, uh, to listen to you. Uh, our eyes are fixed on you. We're seeking your face above all other things. So, Father, we thank you for your presence in this place on this beautiful day. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, we, we, uh, I had a great suggestion from someone here this morning. All week we've been pieing Pastor Jim in the face for kids as they bring visitors. And then, did you see how many hands went up when we looked at first-time visitors here? I think the adults should get to pie Pastor Jim in the face. <laughs> Nah, we better not do that. That's a whole lot of whipped cream. <laughs> well, let me just share just a little bit with you. You know, interestingly enough, today, uh, July 19th, marks the day that one of my heroes died. Uh, ju it just seems like a few years ago, a man by the name of Bill Bright, maybe some of you have, have heard that name. He was the developer, the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ. Uh, there's one of those ministries at Clarion, at, at Slippery Rock, and a lot of our uh, local colleges, and, and I remember uh, how this man's drive and vision and, and sense of mission for the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, it, it, has, it has impacted even me. When I went to uh, Slippery Rock University uh, for my undergrad, I remember uh, going to the Campus Crusade and how, how Jesus really transformed my life through that, uh, through that ministry and outreach. 
Uh, I found my wife in that ministry and outreach. Mandy over here holding my uh, little son. Uh, we have, we've just been so blessed through what Bill Bright has done uh, through his devotion to the Lord. And uh, it's, it's uh, a special day for me as I just uh, think back on all that he accomplished. And, and his drive and his sense of mission came right from the source. Jesus Christ was, was a man who knew his purpose, knew his mission. He knew why he was here. Uh, in, in Luke chapter 4, he's telling the people around him what his purpose is. And he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me uh, to preach the gospel to the poor, to proclaim liberty to the captives. And Jesus knew exactly what he came for in his, his sense of passion and, and mission drove him to the point that uh, he had something to passionately live for and even willingly die for. And as I speak to so many people in my generation, I know that there are, there are many who are jealous of someone who has such a sense of purpose in this life. I, I've spoke to so many people who have done damage to their bodies and made terrible choices, trying to numb the pain of living a life that has no meaning or purpose. Because that's, that's not what we've been created for. We, we have deep within us a sense of, of mission. We are here for something greater than ourselves. And we pursue all kinds of different things. But God has intended that source to be one place. And that is to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what Bill Bright found. That's why he was such a man of, of vision. So I'm going to just preach for a moment from Luke chapter 11. And let me give you just a little bit of background. Jesus had done something miraculous here. He had actually shown His authority and power by casting a demon out of a man. And all the crowds that were watching at this point, they were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And they were looking at the ministry of Jesus and they were saying, I don't know that you are who you say you are. I think that you're doing this out of the power of Satan. Or, or, or we, don't, we don't have enough uh, signs yet. We give us a, a, a sign that shows that you are who you say you are, that you are the, the Son of God. And Jesus responds to the crowd in a way that, that maybe would surprise us. I mean, Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth. He has the power to do miracles. And here's a massive crowd saying, Jesus, show us, prove to us, give us a sign that you are who you say you are. And in my mind, this would be a great opportunity for Jesus to just call lightning down from the sky or do something miraculous to prove to everybody that He is God the Son incarnate in, in human form. But, but listen to what Jesus does as He responds to this request in Luke 11, verse 29. It says, When the crowds were increasing, He began to say, This generation is an evil generation. It seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. Hmm. Have you ever asked God for a sign? I've asked God for a sign before. Have you ever asked God for a sign? You know when we read in the Bible that God is offended when we ask for a sign. I wonder why that is. Why do we offend God when we ask for a sign? Hebrews 11.6 says this, that without faith it is impossible to please God. Do you know what we do to God when we ask Him for a sign? We say, we would like to be exempt from the faith that pleases you, and we would like proof that you are who you say you are. But that removes faith from the equation. That's approaching God from a stance of disbelief. We do not believe you, God. Prove you are who you say you are. Jesus says this comes from a, a wicked generation. We are not to do this. I had a, I had a professor at my Bible college who told that he was an amazing man. He was over apologetics, which is the defense of the faith. An amazing mind. Gary Habermas was his name. And, and he told the story of when he was a young teenager, he challenged God. He did not believe in God's existence. Listen to what he did. Each day as he walked to school, he would have to go through a, a, a field where there was a giant hedgerow, a line of trees. And in the line of trees, there was a giant oak that dwarfed everything else. One day, on his way to school, he told God, he gave him this challenge. He said, if you're real, God, knock that oak tree down. And then he swirled around, and he said, Aha! It's still standing, just like I thought. But the story continues. 
The next day, Gary's walking through the field on his way to the school, and guess which one tree was laying in the field? The oak tree, but that's not the end of the story. Here's what you need to understand. You know what the response of Gary was? That is the craziest coincidence I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> Proof, signs, do not grow faith within us. It doesn't work. God's not going to give us a sign because it doesn't do anything. With the only way that we can respond to God in the way that He desires, that moves us and transforms us in the heart, is through faith. He wants us to choose to follow Him through faith. And Jesus Christ has come to show us that He is everything that He said He was. Uh, so, so let me just point this out. That for, for Him, it, for those who seek a sign, uh, no sign will be given to them except the sign of Jonah. Well, what's the sign of Jonah? Let me, let me read verse 30. For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. Okay, Jonah is a story in the Old Testament, and it, it, he represents uh, the story of repentance and faith to Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. In that day, Assyria was the biggest, baddest, worst nation in the land. They would go conquering other nations, and, and they would do terrible things to the enemy to strike terror and fear into the enemy. Nobody liked Assyria, but nobody messed with Assyria because they were such a wicked generation. Well, Jonah had the prestigious calling to be uh, a prophet to the people of God. It was an honorable position. He liked to be a prophet. But God called him to do something strange. Rather than to be a prophet to his own people in Israel, God called Jonah to go over to the most wicked nation in the land, to their capital city, and to proclaim repentance and judgment. Well, Jonah didn't want to do that. He hated those people. He was afraid that they would repent and that God would forgive them. He didn't want that to happen. So Jonah was a clown of a prophet who ran from God. God didn't allow him to do that. Ended up sending him to Nineveh anyway. Taught him a lot of lessons along the way. And sure enough, when Jonah preached, God's judgment was coming to Nineveh. They repented and they turned in faith to God and God spared the city. That's the sign of Jonah. So when, when Jesus says that, that he is going to be the sign of, of, of Jonah, and so will the Son of Man be to this generation, uh, their obedience in response to Jesus' message of repentance and faith was the exact same thing. It was the exact sign. So you know what Jesus' answer was to the people who asked for a sign? He said, I am the sign. When you look at me, I am the sign that God has come into this world and is doing something about the sin of mankind. So that was the message uh, of Jesus. And certainly, if Nineveh repented to this comical prophet, and, and to a prophet who didn't even care about them, to a prophet who didn't even want to speak to them, and they responded to that, how much more so we as a people, as we hear the message of Jesus Christ proclaimed today, uh, uh, here, here's the Son of God who died for us, who bled for us, who was sacrificed for our behalf to take on the penalty of our sins on His body. How much more so should we repent and respond to a message from a man like this? Now let me carry on here in, in uh, verse 32. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Cornerstone and, and friends, uh, we want to tell you something great is happening here. And it's not, it's not some leader, it's not some ministry, it's not the newest trend. It's not something that we read in a manual for church growth. Something greater is here and it's Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's why this church is, is doing what it's doing. We're keeping our eyes fixed on Christ and, and He is doing things in the lives of the people in this church and in this community. And we're excited about this. Let me, let me read on in verse 31. The Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The queen of Sheba heard from lands away about the wisdom and glory of the kingdom of Solomon. And she traveled lands away and overseas to come and see for herself and hear from this King Solomon. 
And when she got there, she expressed, this was in 1 Kings chapter 10, she said, everything I've heard has fallen short of the reality that I see in King Solomon. What's the point? The point is, is if the Queen of Sheba would travel all that distance just to see the, the glory and the wisdom of Solomon, how much more should the people of our day be flocking to listen to the Word of God because someone greater than Solomon is here. Jesus Christ is in our midst. And He is calling His people to Himself. It is our joy to minister and tell the truths of Jesus to your children. But mom and dad, we live in a generation, grandparents, we live in a generation where we have become too busy to invest in the, the, the things of the kingdom of God. This is my generation. Okay, I understand uh, the, the, the overwhelming options that we have when it comes to entertainment, when we have... Uh, to invest our energy. We have kids programs and sports and, and we have our jobs and we're, we're pursuing trying to, to make homes and keep up with everyone else and get out of debt and do all these different things. We don't have time at the end of the day for God. So we've come into a time in this world where my generation has lost sight of the greatness of Jesus Christ because we've been, we've been distracted by everything else and everything else does not offer us the passion and the purpose of living for something greater than ourselves. Mom and dads, I, I, I want to encourage you. Grandparents, your children are watching you. I'm so glad that you sent them out to us over this last week. Many of our kids don't have mom and dads and grandparents that are, that are active in a church anymore because we've just become overwhelmed by all the things that we've got to get done. But the greatest purpose and priority in our lives has dropped down to such a low place that as our children look at us, they're wondering, is God really real? Is the things that we're learning about really true? If God is as great as, as we sing that He is, and that our teachers say that He is, why, why aren't we taking Him seriously? And, and moms and dads that are my age and a little older, grandparents that have fallen out of the, the, the commitment to put God first in their lives, I, I just want to take a, a moment this morning with a heart of love Okay? I really appreciate that you're here. I want to encourage you. Would you commit in your own life to follow after the God that we serve as an example for the very least for your children to watch and see the reality of His call in your own life? We want to come alongside you, mom and dad and grandparents, and, and, and help uh, educate your children the ways of the Bible and, and disciple you as well and, and you investing in us. That's the body of Christ. That's how the church works. <coughs> So many have fallen out of the church. And we feel that God is doing a work in this community, in this place, where He is gathering His people back together again. We want you to be a part of that. We're not judging you for not being a part, but we want to extend the invitation because I can tell you the ride that we've had over the last three years it has been absolutely breathtaking and miraculous. We've seen the reality and the power of God in a way that I have never seen in my life. This is exciting times, and we want you to be a part of this. Let me finish this small uh, passage right here in verse 33. No one after lighting a lamp puts it in a cellar or under a basket or on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. No one after receiving a light hides it. That's the message here. It, lamps in Jesus' time were extremely precious. They're not like ours. You can go to the dollar store and get something cheap to plug it in and it's It'll work in our homes. But in this time, they were made out of clay filled with olive oil. You put a wick in there and light it. And you put it in the centerpiece of the room so that it would chase the darkness out of all the corners. And, and people would be able to, to come into that light. And, and Jesus is making a point here. No one buys a lamp like that, has and possesses something special like that, and, and puts it under something to hide the light. But here's the point. Not only is it important for us to give the light out that we've received through Jesus Christ, First, and don't miss this, this is even more important. Verse 34, your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful lest the light in you be darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part of dark, it will be wholly bright, as when a lamp with its rays give you light. The direction of the light from Jesus Christ goes inward before it goes outward. We are called to be a light to our community, but some of us are so involved in so many things, we have no time that the light of Christ would fill us. 
It says that the eye is the, the lamp of the body. It is through here as we fix our eyes on whatever it is we're going to fix on this earth that we become filled with that. Of course, God's call is that we would fix our eyes on the face of Christ, that we would seek His face. And as we do that, as He is our sole obsession, our top priority, our number one agenda in each and every day, as we do that, we become filled with the light of Christ. And then we are prepared to be a lamp to the world to everyone else. But so many of us stumble in this area. Even those of us who regularly go to church, we don't take the time that our own eyes would be a source of light. That we are spending time in the Word, spending time speaking to God, and being transformed and renewed on the inside. But yet we try to be a light in our own power in this world. We have to be so careful that God's light first transforms us. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows after me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. See, we have to have Christ living in us before we can be ready to, to invest in our children and be an example in our community. Moms and dads, this is what I want to encourage you to be a part of. Take the initiative yourselves that Christ can transform your own lives and that your children can watch that happen. They're watching it happen here. We're all going through that process, and, and, and the friends that we have brought here today, we want to invite you to be a part of this process. There was a story that I read not too long ago, maybe about six months ago. There was an Indian missionary, and he was a native, so he was an Indian himself. And he would go into, vi into villages, he was a doctor. And he would work on different issues, different uh, bodily uh, things that were going on in villages where they had no doctor. So one village, he, he made a circuit, a tour, where he was, he was removing the cataracts from people's eyes. And it, it, it would demand 18-hour days out of he and his wife. And, and they would set up a little chair and a tent, and people would line up outside, uh, hundreds of people long, because they were blind. They couldn't see through their cataracts. Something we can so easily fix today couldn't be fixed in these people's lives. So they'd line up to have their eyes fixed. And uh, his wife, Margaret, was, was uh, at the station with a scalpel, and she was cutting through people's eyes, removing the cataracts, stitching them closed. As darkness came, she needed someone to hold a light for her. She grabbed a 12-year-old boy and said, can you do this? Can you hold the light? And can you point it in the eyes as I'm working on them? And, and the boy said, yes, he could. And, and she was concerned. Could he, was he really up for the task? Could he watch a scalpel slice through an eye and, and stitches be put through? The first person came, her first patient, she did it. He held, the, he held the, the light right into the eye. If she said move up, he moved up. If she said move left, he moved left. He performed exquisitely. Was not phased. The second person, third, fourth, fifth. He was doing great. She, he far exceeded this 12-year-old boy, her expectations. But then all of a sudden on number six, as she's working on this woman, there's the, the light is going down from the eye down to the cheek. And she'd say, I need you to lift the light up. And he kept faltering. and go to the side. It'd go above, and, and finally she stopped and she said, Young man, can you do this? Because I need you to follow my instructions. And, and she looked at him, and he had tears running down his eyes. And, and she said, What's the matter? And he said, This one, ma'am, this one's my mother. And it just touched him in his heart. He, he couldn't hold the light. He couldn't bear to look. And you know what? Some of us have the same issues. When we look at Jesus Christ, we want to look at Him. He's calling us to look at Him, but it hurts. It breaks our heart because His message cuts us so deeply. He tells us, look at me, and we see a man hanging on a cross, bleeding and dying for the sins that we have committed. And we don't want to look. We want to look somewhere else. We want to do something else. Anything but focus on this, because this is something that we have done. And people, we are so good at numbing the pain and running after something else and saying, I'm just not going to think about this. I'm not going to look at this. I can't bear to think about what this implies in my life. But there's nothing. There's nothing that will do this. There's nothing that will, that will ease the pain and fill the hole in our heart that Christ has created. No matter what we're seeking here today, only Christ can fill that void. I want to I want to just direct you in, in this way. You know, when we sit here and just try to stay out of the picture, how how many people in my generation just stay away from church? We're going to remain neutral. 
We're not going to pick a side. We're just going to do something else. We'll be good people, but we're not going to get involved. Well, in, in chapter Luke chapter 11, verse 23, Jesus speaks directly to this. And this is what he says. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. This is what that means. That Jesus says, as, as darkness is being overtaken and conquered by light, we are not a crowd that has been called to sit in our chairs and be spectators and say, oh wow, look at God do that. Look at the war that's waging. God hasn't called us to do that. He's called us to get out of our seats and be a part of this. And Jesus says, if you won't be a part of it with me, if you're not gathering my people together, if you're not part of building my church with me, then you are part of those who are scattering. There is no neutral ground. Amen. The church of Christ has been greatly hurt by those who have chosen to sit on the sidelines. Mom and dads, I'm not trying to, to guilt anyone here today. We've all been guilty of this at one point in our lives. But I'm begging you, don't, don't just sit there. Don't sit there. Jesus Christ is doing something great in our midst. And He is calling us to step on board and follow Him and gather His people. Don't sit there. Don't not be a part of, of what He is calling us to do. Everyone must take a side. Whose kingdom are you a part of? You know, I, I wish I had more time. Uh, right now the sun is, is about killing me. I can see it on your faces. Uh, I'm going to take just a break here just to let you know we have cold waters right over there. If anybody needs to get a drink, please. Uh, we, we don't want you passing out in your seat here. I wish I could share more from my heart. I wish I had a little bit more time to, just to tell you about how awesome God is, what he, how He's transformed my life, the, the journey that I've been on where I've doubted God, where God has, has never left my side, and how He's built into me and changed me from the inside out. How, how I have something to live for this morning that is greater than myself, that nothing in this world could possibly offer me. It is a privilege to be filled with passion and a sense of mission, knowing just like Jesus what I am here to do, what I've been called to do. God has that plan for every single one of you. Bill Bright wrote a little tiny booklet. It's called The Four Spiritual Laws. We use his track today. The first law is that God has, he loves you and he has created you for a purpose. He has a plan for your life. The second law that comes straight out of the Word of God is that your sin, your rebellion against God to do those things which you know are against His will, as you break His heart and turn from Him, that severs the relationship that God wants to have with you. Your sin keeps you from God. And it breaks God's heart, which is why He sent Jesus Christ. So that Jesus Christ came and lived under every temptation that we face. And He died on the cross, not having any sin of His own, but taking the penalty of all of us. He took every sin in my life, every sin in your life, upon His shoulders. And God poured out His wrath. You know, we celebrate that God is love, but God hates sin. He hates your sin. But He wants to deal with your sin because He loves you. God is love, but He is just, and He will not sweep sin under the carpet. So Jesus Christ died on the cross, and every sin that all of us have ever committed was put on His account as though He was personally responsible. And God's wrath poured out on Jesus until He was satisfied. And now Jesus, after paying the cost and the price and the penalty of our sin, opens up His hands and says, Whoever will come, Whoever will come, whoever will not be ashamed of me, whoever will join me and help build my kingdom and not scatter with wickedness this world to the four corners of the earth, whoever will be a part of my kingdom is welcome to come, but they must come through the cross. We must have our sins forgiven. We must deal with the problem of sin in our lives. The fourth and final law that Bill Bright laid out that comes straight, straight from Scripture is that we must choose to receive Jesus Christ personally. John 1.12 says, As many as received Him, He gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in His name. We talked about uh, just this last service Friday at Vacation Bible School. We had over a dozen children acknowledge that they wanted to make that decision in their lives. 
They wanted to receive Jesus Christ. Parents, ask your child if they made that decision because so many hands went up. We want you to be a part of that process, answering their questions, and we want to come alongside you and help you with that. But I tell you what, moms and dads and friends that are here in a crowd this size, there's, there's some of us who need to make that decision ourselves. There's some of us who need to take the leadership role in our family and say, I'm going to be the one that steps forward and, and begins to live for Christ, and I'm going to bring my family with me. Oh, let me just pause for a moment. Dads, fathers, grandfathers who are the patriarchs of your family, I, I'm praying for men to step up. Men to be the leader, the spiritual leaders of their marriages and families and of their extended families. <laughs> God wants to use you. He wants you to be the leader of your family. I'm asking you specifically and especially, would you answer the call of Christ? Are you active in His church? Is your heart broken for the mission of Christ of reaching the lost and glorifying God? We want you to be a part of that. We want you to, to, to join us or a church if you're traveling from far away. A church in your own area that preaches out of the Word of God and exalts Christ as Lord and Savior. We would love for you to be a part of that here. Uh, but, but this is not some fling for me to try to get you to join our church. Uh, this is a message from God who says, Wake up, men. Wake up, moms and dads. You need to be a part of what I'm doing. And whatever that step looks like for you, many of you need to make that decision this morning. Over the last three years, we have watched so many people under this roof give their lives and surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. I would love for you to be a part of that. I would love for you to join our ranks and be a part of the church that gathers God's people together rather than those who are on the outside being a part of the scattering process. My, my heart longs for you to respond to this because I believe that God has you here for a very specific purpose here this morning. Maybe it was your child that ended up bringing you here, but this is no accident that you are hearing the heart of God. He loves you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to change you and transform you and use you for the reasons that He has created you and put you here in this world. And, and we want to walk beside you as He does that work in your life. I'm out of time because I am baking. Right? I want to pray for you, church. Uh, let, me, let me simply say this. I am so excited you're here. I am honored, friends. Uh, that, that, you, that you came with this motley crew, Cornerstone Church here. Uh, we are having fun reaching people for Jesus Christ. Let me personally invite you to be a part of that process. Let me personally invite you, if you need to surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, we would celebrate with you. We want to give you that opportunity. Let me just right now pray for you. As we all bow our heads and close our eyes, Father, right now we just give you the glory. I thank you for each and every soul that's here this morning. You are an awesome God. And you speak to the hearts of your people. And right now, Father, I just pray for each one that's here. Father, that you would do a work in their heart. We thank you for the children. We thank you for the BPS program that we witnessed this morning. Thank you for our friends. Thank you for each one that's here, God. Now it's your job, God, to speak to the hearts of your people. Father, I pray first for those hearts who are unsure that if they were to die today, that they would go to heaven. For those who are not standing confident in their salvation with Jesus Christ. Father, right now, I just pray that you would work in their hearts and make it clear what needs to happen. The call of the gospel is that each one, Father, would bow their knee to the cross, confessing that they are a, a sinner and receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior by faith. Right now I'm going to pause and no one's looking around. Every eye is closed. Every head is down. We're not here to embarrass anyone, but I want to give you the opportunity. And if you need to make this commitment in your life this morning, if God is speaking to your heart, this is your time. Would you at this moment, as an act of faith, unashamed before the Lord Jesus Christ, would you just place your hand in the air for me to see? I want to pray for you. I'm not going to point you out in any way or embarrass you. But would you just acknowledge before myself and God, Pastor, would you just pray for me? I need to make this commitment in my life and in my heart. No one looking around. Would you place your hand up right now? It takes courage and boldness. Would you please place your hands up?
do it this morning, would place their hands up. No hands having gone up here this morning. Let me challenge you, Mom and Dad, as no one else is still looking around. Friends, grandparents, maybe you've gotten disconnected from God. Maybe it's been refreshing to, to hear uh, the word of the Lord again. And maybe you're, you're scared to look at the cross with both eyes wide open because you know the implications it'll have in your life. I just want to pray for you right now as we invite you to be a part of what God is doing at this church. Father, I just pray for each one here this morning. May there be a firm and fierce commitment to our loyalty to Jesus Christ. May there be no neutral ground here this morning. Everyone, Father, having heard the gospel, understanding why Christ has died for them, whether they reject Him or accept Him, they'll never be the same after looking the King of Kings in the eye. Father, I pray for complete surrender from every part in this place. We bow before You. We give you your rightful place. God, we are, honor you as our Lord, our King, and our Savior. We give you the glory for all that is happening here in this place. And we give you the thanks that we can be here with such precious friends and family. God, we pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Church, I want to invite you to just stand to your feet at this time. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation.